Jeff, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you so much, David. So you have a real knack for being in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, with both the 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 filming that you're doing and also the timing of when you release a lot of these films. Um, talk to me about that. How do you choose projects? Uh, great question. Um, and I think in many ways, um, Chasing Ice was less of an active choice and more of uh, just an opportunity that I was presented with and, and really wanted to, to get on board with and, and to push forward. Um, but after Chasing Ice came out, my first film uh, with both Chasing Coral and with The Social Dilemma, they were both these really deep long term, like it took us a while to pull the trigger on making the projects and then figuring out how to make them. And um, I, I mean, we're sort of going through that same phase right now with trying to figure out what's next. And in many ways, I feel like my full time job right now is to figure out what is the next film that we're going to do. Um, what's going to sustain our interest for multiple years, what's going to be a big and revelatory idea or concept or visual for the public, um, what's going to contribute and make a difference and hopefully add value to society, um, what is, uh, what will work well as a movie, like is it cinematic, is it visual, can we make it a film, should it really be a book or can it be a movie. Um, and our team constantly wrestles with those questions for months and months on end, if not longer, um, to figure out, okay, is this something that's going to meet all those criteria and sustain us and be interesting enough? And, and I think part of it too, just like there's another layer to this, um, you know, I, I like to think I'm pretty well informed about the world. I try to read as much as I can and stay on top of things. And when is something a new idea for me? And is it a new idea for me and for our team? Um, I didn't know about how fast glaciers were changing, right? Uh, when, we, when we started making that film in 2007, climate change was a topic of conversation, but we didn't really have visual evidence of it. And that's what was so brilliant about what James Baylog, the photographer in that film wanted to do, um, was to visualize it. And then um, I thought I knew a lot about climate change. And then um, Richard Beavers introduced me to the ocean and told me that there was a lot of stuff going on in the ocean that I knew nothing about. And I was like, if I don't know about this, other people are gonna find it interesting too. And that same thinking applied to the social dilemma. Um, so I don't know, I think those are sort of the criteria just to like scratch my head and, uh, and riff, riff through it a little bit. But if it meets all of those objectives and if I think it's gonna be interesting and if it's gonna be like, intellectually stimulating for me to dedicate three years of life to mm -hmm. um then then hopefully it'll it'll work its way into being a, a powerful film that's cool so there's a moment in this process that you're kind of describing that i'm really curious about which is when you're starting on one of these projects yeah um I, I, I'm feeling anxious just thinking about it. It sounds so daunting. So can you tell me a little bit about like, where do you even start? Or like when you yeah. see Tristan's post on Facebook and you right. realize that there might be something there, like, right. or that you want to take on this project, like what do you do next? Yeah, oh my goodness, great questions. Um, I think the first thing honestly is convincing my team that this is worth doing. Mm. And I need my team's buy-in. <laughs> Um, and in the case of The Social Dilemma, very explicitly, my producer, Larissa, was resistant to that at the start. She um, uh, cares very much about uh, environmental issues and climate change. And when I first brought to her this idea, I think there's something to be made here. She, she was very skeptical. She was like, you want to do a movie on social media? Like, what's, where, what happened? Like, where did you, where did you go wrong? Right? And um, there was some sense of resistance and uh, it took a while for me to do more research and learn about it and then to share with her and to pitch her effectively on, no, this is really fundamentally reshaping our civilization. This is an underlying issue. This this is an issue underlying all other issues, no matter what issue you care about or anybody else cares about, the way our social media is like puppeteering our information ecosystem is changing all of us. And um, Tristan, one of our subjects referenced it as a climate change of culture. And I think that analogy actually got to Larissa as well of like, wait a second, there is there is something really powerful here. Um, 
uh, just one other thought there. You know, I, the, the seed had been planted for me with Eli Pariser's TED Talk, and I forget if it was 2011 or 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and he, the talk was about um, online filter bubbles. Mm -hmm. and so he was raising awareness about the concept of filter bubbles. And, um, and when seeing that and when thinking through that, it, it really stuck with me. And, and we were seeing that and feeling it in the polarization around climate change. And so uh, that was just a consistent theme that Larissa was able to then see and recognize. And once I got Larissa and our impact team on board, it was sort of like, okay, let's go and explore this. But mm -hmm. I, I think you're, um, these definitely are and can be daunting projects. Um, I, I think in retrospect, because of how challenging Chasing Ice was, and also it wasn't um, very much, it was very much James Baylog, the photographer leading the charge on that project. And I was more of a, you know, going along for the ride. And I don't think I would have done that <laughs> had I known how difficult it was going to be. But once you go through something that difficult, you're like, oh, we know how to do it. The stuff just takes time. And, and I think it's those challenging things that are in many ways the most valuable. Um, all the easy things have been done already. And it's like, if you're going to do something meaningful, it's going to be hard. And by default, it's going to be hard. And um, and I think that's my headspace. Yeah, that's interesting. You say that um, because I, you know, in watching these, uh, doing research for this and doing seeing the interviews, I didn't realize that the, that project had started as such a. Are you are you familiar with um, the Heart of Darkness and Francis Coppola, like yeah. the Apocalypse Now? I like the documentary more than the movie. They're right. both fantastic, but right. um, it kind of reminded me of that, like just this this daunting project that you didn't even really know what you were getting into that turned into right. this this um, masterpiece um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about you and your team is your aim at impact mm -hmm. um, and I was reading through the um, the impact reports you have on your site so there, there's really fantastic impact reports on chasing ice and chasing coral and I'm yeah, assuming there's, there's one coming for um, uh, social dilemma as well. But the, you have these, these reports are actually useful and you have an impact framework there. Did you come up with that or um, is it's like a quadrant of how to tell a story and then how to think about your impact? Is that something you guys created or is that um, something that... There, there's a phenomenal group called Doc Society um, mm -hmm. that is uh, one of the only groups um, that does this kind of work, but they're very uniquely at the intersection between nonfiction film and impact. And they've built a number of different frameworks um, that have all resonated. Uh, that I think from our team's perspective, there's this gut level, oh, is this gonna make a difference? And the answer is yes, and we move forward with it. Um, but we never really analyzed or broke down like before we were making something, what, what goals or objectives it was gonna hit. Um, yeah, but sorry, I cut you off there. No, that's it. That, that I mean, keep going. I think I was thinking about like, um, so the, those quadrants I think are really useful because they, they talk about whether, I'm going to pull it up real quick just so I have it right. Mm -hmm. um, like whether a project is known or unknown, whether there's strong opposition or weak opposition and kind of how to frame the story um, right. given this, the kind of the state of your audience or the state of the world that you want to land in. And I, I just think that's a really, I think that's a useful framework for um, actually all sorts of communication, not just documentary filmmaking. Right. I think that's um, because one of the things that that's come up as I'm doing this research about um, into the science of science is there's this emerging science of science communication. I don't know if you're familiar with any of this research, but it's actually pretty interesting because, you know, we've spent the past, I don't know, 30 years digging out of this hole, which is, you know, when Carl Sagan came out with Cosmos, the book, and then the television series, he was actually kind of ostracized from the scientific right. community. There's a whole yeah. term called Saganization, where yeah. scientists are, are told not to, or they're like penalized from a professional standpoint right. for trying to popularize what they're doing. Right. Um, and it's almost like we have a, a, finally we have a new generation who understands the importance of communicating right. what they're doing. Right. And right. at the same time, we have this 
the actual like research, the science of science communication that's looking into, okay, what's actually effective here? Are, yeah. Is this communicate, like actually applying rigor to what right. they're doing? Right. And what it's showing us is that it's not actually what we think we're doing, where we just have to give people more information is actually not changing minds. It's in right. fact, people are more likely to um, believe what they believe, even if they have more information. Anyways, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of emerging research that's showing we don't, we don't know. And so- I'd love to offline with you on that and, and tap into that out of curiosity, but- Well, yeah. I, I, th I think it's, I think it's relevant for, for you too, because I'm going through the impact reports. And I mean, you guys are collecting so much data, right? Like, you know, how many views, which communities we're, we're talking to, how many times is it shared? How, you know, how far is this going? Meanwhile, science is measuring things like paper citations and, you know, like they have their own metric system. And what I think we need are um, metrics that are, that kind of blend the two, right? Like how are we actually, how are we measuring not just how many people we're reaching, but how these ideas are influencing the way people think and the way people ask questions and um, make decisions. So, you know, I guess the question is what, um, you guys are doing such a good job measuring things. What metrics do you wish you had or what's the kind of the front line of, of measurement that you're thinking yeah. about? Great question. Um, uh, I have been, and our team has been very curious about the science of communication. Um, mm -hmm. And we know of just a couple of people that are starting to do more and more research there and, and work there. And um, there are organizations that are trying to quantify the impacts of films more and more. Um, and there are different frameworks that we've heard of, and there are different frameworks that we've been working with. Um, we are working on a partnership right now to do some um, to some to do some serious metrics on the social dilemma and measuring of people who watch documentary films, what is the mindset shift of people who may, may not be interested in these issues? Um, can we compare amongst people who have seen the social dilemma what their impact is, uh, what what their um, worldview is now after seeing the film compared to uh, you know a control group that hadn't seen the film? Um, and so measuring the impact of the film explicitly on the people who saw it. Um, this stuff is pretty challenging to quantify. And in, and in many ways, we're sort of dabbling in the art of shifting culture. Mm -hmm. And how do you change culture? How do you change societal narratives? How do you change the zeitgeist? Um, and those are really, really tough things to measure, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have countless anecdotal stories I mean, we've had um, uh, we've had both Lindsey Graham and Nancy Pelosi um, name drop the social dilemma in different contexts, right? Both people, like on different political sides of the aisle, were referencing this film as a way to think about how social media is affecting society in different ways. We've had massive engagement with politicians, far more than we ever had before, um, with, even with all the climate work. Um, so for us, it's been a huge measure of success where we are engaging politicians at the highest levels to be thinking about and talking about a different framework of social media and big social. Um, so there are countless like subjective quantitative, uh, you, you know, like uh, subjective stories and anecdotes like that. And then the, the quantitative metrics are things that we're constantly looking for. Um, but it's very much an imperfect science right now. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And it's been, it's interesting because I think that from this, uh, the scientific perspective, the, the community of meta science researchers, we're finally to that point where we're having this discussion. I mean, literally it's been digging out of this hole of trying to just convince people that science communication is something that we need to do. Right. Um, right. So I think we're, we're actually just to the starting line there. Um, well, something you've done that I think is underrated in science, perhaps it's more common in filmmaking, is this idea of long-term project documentation. Hmm. So, I, you, know, you know, James and, and Chasing Ice, he's a National Geographic photographer and those folks spend years on assignment or like the BBC right. filming for David Attenborough's films, right? right? Like those are year, year long project, years right. long projects. 
what you've done is you've documented scientists and these, these kind of issues in science, especially chasing coral, I think is a really good example of this, where you followed the scientists through time through the, the, like the length of experiment, like the asking the questions, the trying to gather data, the trying to communicate right. those results. Um, I call that science through time. And yeah. it's actually a really uncommon way that people get to experience hmm. um, science. Yeah. And uh, normally people like the, their experience of science is like the, the, the Today Show. Science says you shouldn't be drinking so right. much coffee. You know, right. it's just the results or it's just the, the kind of the, the flashy awards or, yeah. you know, Dr. Fauci says. And I think that is unfortunate that we treat science as news. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've shown is that by using time as a tool, right. um, that we can actually communicate the scientific process. Right. And I think that that does... Um, that does something special. So yeah. um, can, can you talk about like the use of time both in your, your, right. your filmmaking, but also any advice you have for, for scientists to use, use like the, the, the medium of time to communicate? Right. Um, as a storyteller, those are essential tools and obstacles and challenges that come along the way are the most compelling parts of the story. And one of the things that I love that we were able to do with Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, like by documenting the process, you're giving the audience insight and exposure into the trials and tribulations and where the experiments hit a roadblock and how you solve through that. I mean, that from, from the perspective of like, certainly younger audiences and high school students are younger, like I, I want, those audiences to see those struggles and to watch people fight through it and figure out and solve new ways through problems like that is the scientific method and that is like overcoming adversity in life and those are such important values in my mind um and like it's the commitment and the see-through um the, the follow-through on on a project um so for us it's not um I guess it's a it's a more common, you know, as 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 you're framing it that way, and I'm thinking through it, like it's it's not always how filmmaking is done. In part because it's a harder way to do filmmaking too. Like you have to document everything, and you're constantly documenting everything for years, not knowing what may or may not make it into the film, mm -hmm. right? And what are going to be the relevant plot points and the story points. Um, we got very lucky with Chase and Coral. You know, we were documenting everything. And then it was deep into the project when we realized that Zach would potentially be a meaningful character in the film. But fortunately, Zach, like we had enough footage of Zach from the beginning. Like I was able to reverse engineer, like, oh, we've got all this footage of Zach from uh... the first year and his role in the project and his involvement and how he could become a character because we had that footage. Um, when we realized he would play more of an emotional climax in the film. And, you know, that's, we had two years of footage of him already installing these cameras and going through those experiences. Um, so had we not done that, had we not had that, that, you know, that archive of footage already, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, this is, it's one of the tricky things. It's like, you don't know where the story is going to unfold. Like, a might lead to E to G to Z back to B to something else, right? And in our job as storytellers is in the edit room, we have to craft it so that you can connect A to you know C to E to G, whatever, but it's more linear and it's smoother. Um, but you may or may not have all of those um, elements um, in you know on your hard drives in the footage. So um, so for I don't know, from my perspective, those it showing the adventure, showing the challenges, those were what we were hoping would make it accessible to audiences. And we were, oh my goodness, we had so many, there's so many times where like, oh wow, this, look at this technical challenge that we had. And then we go in and we edit that whole scene and it becomes really technical and really wonky. And then we show it to somebody and they're like, it doesn't make sense and it glosses over. So we're like, okay, we got to tone that back. We have to get the point across and reveal enough and how do we make it work for like i wanted to 
I want to give insights into the technical challenges, but not overwhelm people who might not be interested in the technical sides. And, mm -hmm. and how do you design for lots of different audiences? Um, that's another technique that we have in filmmaking and in storytelling. Like um, we can do test screenings. We do that all the time. Uh, like if I'm just showing a friend or a producer, like it could be like a, a five minute scene that we're working on. And hey, what do you think of this five minutes? Uh, this or that, or you know, you get your feedback. And then when you get to a rough cut of the film, you screen the hour and a half. It usually starts like, here's two hours of the movie or two and a half hours and you watch it and you know it's gonna be painful. It's like the worst day. Hmm. You get you and your close, close team to sit together and you just, you know, you're ripping the bandaid off today and <laughs> it's gonna suck. Um, and you watch through it and you're like, we have so much more work to do. This is exhausting and daunting. But um, I think having done it now enough times, it's like that is part of, you know, that's part of the process. You know, that's a, a big hurdle you have to get through is that first that first review. But when you finish watching that, you have really good notes like this section way too long, that section way too long. This section's confusing. How do we simplify this? This other section, do we have to go mm -hmm. back to an older version that we did? There's a lot like we keep all the old versions in the editing because sometimes like the thing we cut a month ago that we mm -hmm. thought was terrible is actually going to work better the mm -hmm. way we've redesigned it. Um, it's it's a, a constant series of puzzle piecing, um, mm. filmmaking, documentary filmmaking. I just think of it as a big puzzle that you have to solve. Um, yeah. Well, that's what really interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I mean, I so does it get easier? Because I know like I'm editing these like podcasts and it like when I started doing this, I'm like, oh my God, this is going to take up all my time. And it's actually, it gets easier. So I'm wondering if there's a, a formula that will start, that is emerging for you that we can take and learn. And, th and the reason I ask that is because like there, there are a lot of books to try or, and programs to try and help scientists communicate. And right. I find them all kind of wanting. Hmm. Like it's like they're, they're trying to get people to tell a story but they're not like what you just said about A to Z to, to Y to B. I think that's, um, you know, they want, they're trying to coach people into say, into like, like a, like a clean, like arc. And I think what you're saying is, I, I think what they skip over is that it's going to be all over the place first and you can, you, yeah. you need to document it. So, um, I don't know yeah. what what's what's the formula what advice would you have for scientists yeah great stuff um first of all i love your questions and uh it for me it has gotten easier in that by feature documentaries are difficult they take a long time shorts i i miss doing shorts because they're so much faster and easier and mm -hmm. the requirements in a five minute video are very different than the requirements in an hour and a half long piece. Um, but uh, the, it has gotten easier and easier over time for me around um, getting more and more fluent around storytelling and understanding the principles and the rules of storytelling more and more. Um, what I would say that very often we try to overcomplicate stories and there's, um, I, I can share, I can just do like a quick little run through of like story structure if you want. Um, yeah, yeah. Do a quick breakdown, but um, Pixar, I'm gonna start with this Pixar frame that, they, um, that they've that they offered um, and then break that down into a little bit more nuance. Um, but there's, there's Pixar, there's Hero's Journey, there's a three act structure, there's a bunch of different systems. But in my head, I look at like a simplified version that takes the best of, of those and leaves the excess. Um, so the Pixar story spine is once upon a time there was blank. Every day blank until one day blank. And because of that and because of that and because of that blank 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 until finally blank. And ever since that day blank. And if I just map that out for a second there are that that is a three act structure and there are two turning points there's the exposition once upon a time somebody did blah 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 and every day this was their normal this was their exposition the former position right until one day that until one day is a turning point that's the shift from act one to act two 
and that sets up the protagonist on a quest with challenges for act two. Mm -hmm. And it poses a question. First of all, actually, uh, I just want to give credit to Vicki Curtis, who shared a lot of this with me and is where I've learned it from. And she has a great story instructors. A lot of this is coming from the theater world and dramaturgy as well. But mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so this, that moment, um, until one day blank, sets up a question that then gets answered with the climax. That's the most important relationship in the story is a question gets posed and you don't know the answer of it until it gets answered. And that answer is the climax. And that answer in an ideal scenario is also the moral reveal of the character. That the morals and the, the morality of your character comes to light in how they answer that question that was posed earlier. And, mm -hmm. and that transition from act two to act three that, that, that entire act two is all of the struggles to get to that answer and to that climax. And when that gets answered and that gets revealed, that basically wraps the story and act three is, and ever since that day, until finally, um, until finally blank is the climax. And then, and ever since that day blank, that's like retirement. That's the denouement. That's the, like you wrap a bow on the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. So in, Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, they are very, very similar structures of either a photographer or a scientist. There's a team that learns about a thing and sets out on a quest to document that thing, right? Whether it's changing glaciers or changing corals, it's actually the same structure. Like the quest begins to capture this thing. Mm -hmm. All of act two is the trials and tribulations. This didn't work, they were struggling, but you know what they're trying to do. Like, you know, in the back of your head, the story isn't answered yet because mm -hmm. We're trying to do this thing and it isn't done yet. And in both stories, actually, the, the emotional reveal, um, James Balog is struck, like despite his knee and physical challenges, he still is plowing through to get these photographs. And in Chasing Corals, Zach Rago, despite like watching these corals die and seeing like the worst depression that he could possibly imagine, he still goes out there and he's still diving and he's still trying to document the stuff. And those moral reveals of dedication and determin determination mm -hmm. with back both of those films then go to the, the reveal and the climax of we've captured the golden place. Like we got the footage and here is the footage and the audience sees what that quest was all about. And then mm -hmm. after you hit that climax, you can then resolve the story and you know, you're wrapping things up. And now that we know this, where does it leave us? And we try to end on positive notes and optimistic notes and et cetera, et cetera. But that's effectively, that is the, the backbone of both of those films. Um, the social dilemma is slightly different, so I'll skip that for now. But, but in terms of how that applies to a scientist or anybody trying to communicate their work, um, you know, the hypothesis conclusion is very much the same sort of structure, yeah. right? So it's thinking, yeah. Question, right? How like, how does this thing work? This is what we think. And we're going to figure out, is this the case or not? And then the experiment, like you're trying, you're testing, right? You're trying this, you're trying that, you're trying that. This worked, this didn't work until finally we got to this. And now that we know this, this is, you know, this is our new state. This is our new position that we're in because there's been a change now from where we started the story and where we ended the story, right? So experimentation in science really is it is a story and it maps to a story arc really well and it maps to a three act structure really, really well. And those are in many ways, like that's the, that's the fundamentals of storytelling. And that's how, in my mind, the best films and the, not the best films, films that are easy to watch that audiences just get inherently and don't have to like think and analyze. There's, there's a completely different space for films as art and experimental film that really pushes and doesn't follow any of those rules. But in terms of like a foundational story, um, those I, that, that's what I find to be very, very accessible. So normally I, this is my last question, but I'm going to ask you now as, um, the question is, what are your ideas for making science better? And the, the, to add more context is, you know, we've been watching this really interesting, I mean, you know, obviously horrible, you know, the pandemic has been awful. But it's been an interesting story from a scientific standpoint in just the, the both these amazing high highs of 
discovering, you know, mRNA vaccines and just making these discoveries and right. bringing vaccines in record time, right. but also really incredible low lows where right. people are, you know, doubting scientists and, and, you know, death threats to, to Fauci and just not understanding the scientific process right. in just like a, a society that doesn't, um, I don't want to say doesn't understand what science is. There's just this disconnect between science and society. Yeah. And um, what are you screaming yeah. at the TV? What are you screaming at the scientists to do to improve that? What's your, right. what are your best ideas? Yeah, I, I love this question. And I've got, I'm, I'm thinking through it quite a bit right now. Um, both thoughts on what I what I've always considered ideas that I've had for a long time, but but more specifically to your question around like what could be done. Um, so, first off, let's not rely on journalism to communicate science. Um, the mandates and objectives of of news outlets and journalism aren't most well suited to communicate science effectively. Um, and then I think. Uh, written journalism has a ever shrinking audience and the people who would pursue that. Um, but, but the methods there are usually just reporting on the conclusions and not the process. And I think one of the big gaps here is that because the public doesn't have access to the process typically, and they're not reading the journals, right? And I don't even read all the journals, right? It's like, I wish I had more time to actually read, read the papers. But, but the, um, when, when somebody hears all the thinking that went into an experiment and all the things that they ruled out and why and how, it kind of becomes irrefutable in and of itself. And the public doesn't see that. Mm -hmm. What I think needs to happen, I think we need storytellers embedded in all scientific organizations. Like, like every org, JPL, NASA, every, every entity that's out there should have storytellers in-house. I think they should be animators. They should have a, sh a small team of storytellers. And with every piece of research that's going on, the storytellers work with those scientists and those researchers and they direct them because oftentimes science, scientists are not the most effective communicators, but Build these partnerships out where storytellers and scientists can work together to convey, hey, look, this was the question that we had. Why does such and such do such and such or what, whatever, right? Like, how do, we, how do we figure out what's causing COVID? How do we figure out how to build a vaccine for it? How do we figure out any of these things, right? And you lay out in a quick form in a, it could, these could be three minute videos, five, like under 10 minute videos, right? You can make a whole compelling series of under 10 minute videos that are pithy and catchy that map out, this is how we figured out a vaccine for COVID. We tried this, we tried that, we tried that. This is what we knew, this is what we didn't know. These mm -hmm. were the questions that we had. All right, mm -hmm. we experimented with this, 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 those all failed. We experimented with that, 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 that failed. We got to this point, oh, something worked. And then we tried that and we iterated off of that and that got us to this point and then here we are today, all right? Like once again, simple structure, question, answer, the, the struggles in between. but. People would watch that. I think audiences are hungry for that. There are great science channels on YouTube and elsewhere that convey and communicate these exact types of things. But if we had, and then also like, if you have that family member who's denying what Fauci says, you could be like, hey, why don't you watch this video? And it breaks down the whole thing and it gives insight and it gives you a peek behind the curtain. And, and it's like, oh, I had that question and that skepticism in the back of my mind, but they answered that. Like they ruled that out. They posed that question. They're not trying to hide something. They, 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 you know, spoke to the audience with respect and like conveyed why that is an impossibility, right? I'm, I'm just making up parameters, right? But, but the notion of sharing more, but not overwhelming, keeping to the high level points and really, I think talking through the process and explaining the process, and this was our question, this is how we got to our conclusion. That would go such a long way with the general public. And I think every scientific organization, at this point, I think these organizations all have a responsibility to be better at communicating their work with the public, that every paper potentially gets paired with a three minute video. Like, give me the summary, give me the Cliff Notes version of this paper, and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, 
3% of the audience is going to be like, oh, maybe I should read this paper now and fully understand the methodology and how they went about it. And did they check this and this and this and right. But, but the vast majority of people won't. Um, but it'll give the public so much more confidence in the science as well, because they see, oh, there was some academic rigor that went into this in a way that exceeded their expectations, right? That would be my vote. Like we need science communication at every organization out there. I love that. That's a great answer. Um, cool. Well, I, I, I think that's great. I think that this is gonna be um, a really useful uh, video for for science communicators to learn from and, yeah. and hopefully policymakers and funders too because yeah. I think that's I think we're we're finally to the place where everyone gets it but yep. now I think we just need to hammer home the point that you just made mm -hmm. and make it happen because and, and also just just to add to that like if there's an organization listening out there and you're trying to figure it out please reach out to us find us at exposurelabs.com right and like we've never done this before but happy to help consult or guide or figure out like it, it is so needed. It is so, so needed. Yeah. Here, here. Cool. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for coming yeah. and uh, I appreciate it. Awesome.